Scientists have detected the largest black hole merger ever recorded, a collision so massive it sent ripples through space-time itself. Captured by gravitational wave detectors on Earth, these black holes are more than 100 times bigger than our Sun. An next report telling you more. The cosmos, a realm of unfathomable power and mystery, has once again unveiled a spectacle that challenges the very foundation of our understanding. A cosmic tremor, a silent symphony echoing across billions of light years has just reached Earth. Two monsters of the universe, each tens of times the mass of our sun, met in a violent embrace, merging into one supermassive black hole unlike anything seen before. The collision unleashed immense gravitational waves, which are invisible ripples that warped the very fabric of space-time, traveling across the universe for billions of years before crashing into Earth's detectors. The European Virgo and American LIGO observatories captured the signal. A low thunderous hum that echoed from deep space. Scientists now confirm it to be the biggest black hole merger ever recorded, with the resulting singularity weighing over a hundred solar masses. Physicists suspect the black holes that merged were themselves products of earlier mergers. That would explain how they came to be so massive and why they were spinning so fast, as merging black holes tend to impart spin on the object they create. Their immense mass and extreme spin push the very limits of current gravitational wave detection technology and theoretical models. This discovery strongly suggests a hierarchical formation where these colossal black holes may themselves be the products of earlier, smaller mergers, a cosmic lineage of ever-growing giants. Bureau Report, we on World is One. India's beloved street snacks, jalebi and samosa may soon come with health warnings, just like cigarette packets. These warnings will highlight the high levels of oil, sugar and trans fats. Well, these are closely linked to lifestyle diseases. The campaign is being rolled out first at Ames Nagpur and this will serve as the pilot location for the initiative. Cafeterias on the campus will begin displaying warning boards next to food counters. Nutritionists have welcomed this move as a necessary step in a country where deep fried snacks and sugary sweets are consumed on a daily basis. But small traders and sweet shop owners argue that this is an assault on culture and livelihoods, claiming that the government is demonizing tradition. The government says that it is not a ban or restriction, perhaps, but an awareness drive. The warning label campaign is expected to expand to other cities and institutions in the coming months. Officials hope that this will act as a wake-up call and push more people towards balanced diets. According to a recent study published in Lancet, 70% of India's urban population is classified as obese or overweight. The study also revealed that 30 million adults in India are either overweight or obese. And 62 million diabetic Indians exhibit obesity-related traits. Frequent consumption of deep-fried and sugary snacks is also a major contributor. By 2050, an estimated 440 million Indians could be overweight or obese. And shifting our focus to Taiwan now, Taiwan is preparing full throttle for what it sees as a possible invasion tactics by China. From military and civilian drills to deploying the best of troops and technology, Taiwan seems to be leaving no stone unturned to put up a solid fight. But as you know, wars are hardly won without allies and partnerships who help with resources, money, manpower and global backing, in all of which Taiwan is turning out to be unlucky. 
As Taiwan gears up for a potential military conflict, America's allies have started weighing in, such as Australia, a major security ally of the U.S. When asked about his position on Taiwan during a six-day China visit, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said that he supported the status quo. Take a listen. Uh, we support the status quo when it comes to uh, Taiwan. We don't support any unilateral action uh, there. Uh, we have a clear position and uh, we have been consistent about that. What's important when it comes to international relationships is that you have a stable, orderly, coherent position going forward. Australia does. We want peace and security in our region. Uh, we don't want any change to the status quo. Well, earlier, Australia's Defence Industry Minister Pat Conroy said that the country will not commit troops in advance to any conflict. This is in response to a report that claims that the Pentagon has urged its trusted allies to clarify their stance should a situation arise where the United States and China enter into a war on the Taiwan issue. In an interview with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Conroy said that Australia prioritizes its sovereignty and said that the decision will be determined by the government of the day. Well, first, I don't disclose uh, confidential discussions, but I make a couple of broad points. One, we don't engage in hypotheticals. We don't discuss hypotheticals. But secondly, the decision to commit Australian troops to a conflict will be made by the government of the day. Not in advance, but by the government of the day. And that's our position, and it's been long established. Australia, in its own backyard, too, is stocking up its war arsenal. It opened its largest ever war fighting exercise with the U.S. involving 30,000 troops from close to 20 nations. And well, according to a report by the Financial Times, besides Australians, the U.S. Under Secretary of Defense for Policy has been imploring Japanese officials to come clean on the position on Taiwan as well. Important to note here is that both Australia and Japan are members of the Quad Alliance alongside India and the U.S. And with America's foreign policy against Taiwan under scrutiny, Taiwan is facing what seems like a collective abandonment from the U.S. and its allies, thus making the court's position on the self-governed island extremely precarious. Where does all of that leave Taiwan is the question we ask tonight. Well, at least 89 people have been killed in Syria's southern Sweda province as clashes between Sunni Bedouin tribes and Druze fighters raged for a second day on Monday. The violence began on Sunday when Bedouin gunmen abducted a Druze vegetable vendor, sparking retaliatory kidnappings. Though the hostages were later released, but fighting carried on till Monday. With mortar fire hitting villages and dozens wounded, the streets of Sweda were completely empty. Well, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, death toll includes 46 Druze fighters, 4 civilians, 18 Bedouin fighters and 7 unidentified people in military uniforms. As violence escalated, Israel also said it struck several tanks in Sweda, citing its commitment to protect the Druze community. But further details were not provided. In the aftermath of the violence, Military convoys, armed civilian vehicles and ambulances transported wounded to Damascus. Syrian Interior Minister has blamed the lack of state and security institutions for the ongoing tensions in Syria, further urging the reactivation to ensure civil peace.
تم the security deployment plan has been prepared by the ministries of interior and defense within the sweda governorate with the aim of asserting state authority and applying the law and disarming the groups who are operating outside the law and spreading chaos in sweda Two spiritual leaders call for calm demanding global protection rather than the entry of security forces into the province The fighting just highlights the challenges facing Syrian interim leader Ahmed Al Shara whose Islamist forces ousted President Bashar al-Assad in December. Remember, the country is still reeling from 14 years of war with Al Shara now struggling to contain violence. The Syrian military announced troop deployments as well as safe corridors for civilians promising to end the fighting quickly and decisively. Syria's Druze community, followers of an hysteric religion, split from Shiite Islam around number around 700,000. They are mainly based in the Sweda province. Bedouin and Druze factions have a long-standing dispute with violence occasionally erupting in late April and early May as well. It's all these incidents of period violence in Syria that is perhaps undermining confidence in the new Syrian authorities ability in a bid to protect the minorities of Syria with fighting intensifying in Sweda the fate of Syria's minorities remains uncertain under the new leadership